we are going to be talking about Laplace analysis. This is arguably one of the most important mathematical tools in all of engineering. In this case, we're going to be using it to simplify the process of solving a system of differential equations. Starting off, we need to define what the Laplace transform does. And what that is, is you can take a function of time and through this integration, turn it into a function that no longer is a function of time, but rather a function of s. And the utility of this function is that when you're solving a system that includes differential equations, such as df dt, you can move to a domain where you no longer have derivatives within your system of equations. So what we're going to do is find the Laplace representation of our circuit elements. That way, when we're writing the equations for these components as we solve our circuits, we're no longer going to have that system of differential equations. So a few really important transforms that I want to show. The first is the Laplace of a u of t, or a step function. And what a step function is, it's a function that's zero for all values until you hit zero, and then it goes to a value of one, and it stays one for all values after zero. Now, since the Laplace transform starts at zero and integrates to infinity, the Laplace transform of u of t is going to be the same as the Laplace transform for a constant one. Since the integration starts at zero, the Laplace transform won't give you a different answer. So the result of taking Laplace transform of 1 gives you a value of 1 over s. The next thing we need to talk about is if we have a constant multiplying the function that we're taking the Laplace of. Now, something interesting happens if you take the Laplace of a constant multiplied a function of time, you end up with that same constant multiplied by that function Laplace transform to the s domain. And this should be somewhat intuitive, because if we have a k multiplying this f of t within our Laplace transform function, we can pull that outside of the integral and it's not going to affect that integration. So for the same reason, you end up with k multiplied by that function of s. Now the last thing I'm going to point out is the most important. So if you have a derivative of a function with respect to time and you take the Laplace of that, you end up with s multiplied by that function in Laplace domain minus its initial condition. And this is amazing because you've gone from a domain where you have derivatives to a domain where you no longer have them. And this enables you to solve these as a standard system of equations. So with these ideas in mind, let's talk about transforming our circuit elements. So if I have a voltage source, the equation for my voltage source is that the potential across it is equal to the positive side minus the negative side. So taking the Laplace of this, we can say that's one multiplied by some constant V. And really by combining these two, we can say that the Laplace representation of a voltage source is going to be V divided by S is equal to V plus as a function of S minus V minus as a function of S. Now for the current source, we know that we have a value I going through our source, but that I is a constant. So we can say this turns into I of S divided by S. Now for our inductor, this one's a little bit trickier. So we have some potential across it, and that's equal to the inductance value multiplied by the derivative of the current with respect to time. So the Laplace transform of this is going to be V plus of S minus V minus of S, that potential difference across it. And this is going to be equal to the inductance value L multiplied by di dt. Now di dt is a derivative, so we're going to say s multiplied by that function minus its initial condition. So I can write s multiplied by i of s minus my initial condition, which is going to be the value of current through my inductor at time is equal to zero. So we're gonna say i of zero here. And that's the Laplace domain equation for my inductor. For the capacitor, we have that ic, the current through my capacitor, is equal to the capacitance value multiplied by the derivative of V plus minus the derivative of V minus with respect to time. So to represent that in Laplace domain, I can write IC of S is equal to the capacitance value multiplied by S times the node voltage difference in S domain. So V plus of S minus V minus of S. So that takes care of the first part, but now we also have to subtract our initial condition which is going to be the initial difference between those node voltages. So we'll say minus V plus of zero minus V minus of zero. And that is the Laplace domain representation of my capacitor. So for resistors and dependent sources, those are going to be the same in Laplace domain 
However, everything is going to be a function of s. So now that we have the new equations for our components, let's move on and apply this to an example problem. And our goal is going to be to find vo as a function of s, and then use that to take the inverse Laplace transform and go back to the time domain to find vo as a function of time. So in our circuit, we start off under the condition where we're connected here, and this is an open circuit. And the circuit has been this way for a long time, so we've reached steady state. And then at time is equal to zero, this becomes an open circuit, and we become connected over here, and we're going to use Laplace to see what happens for time greater than zero once that switch moves. Because our Laplace equations for the inductor and the capacitor require us to know the initial conditions of those components, in order to solve this circuit in Laplace domain, the first thing I need to do is find those initial conditions and do DC steady state analysis for the switch in the first position. So now what I'm going to do is redraw this circuit in the DC steady state operation when the switch is in the red first position. So I've drawn the equivalent circuit for the switch in the first position. Now in drawing this, I've omitted that 25 ohm resistor because with nothing connected to the other side of it, that open circuit component is not going to affect my analysis. So we're assuming that this circuit has been in this position for a long time. And under that assumption, my capacitor is going to behave as an open circuit, and my inductor is going to behave as a short circuit. So we can erase the capacitor and treat this inductor as a wire here. And at this point, we're ready to begin our DC analysis. And the first thing I'm going to do, as always, is label my component currents. So I can go ahead and call this I1. I can call this I2. And this is going to be one continuous current because there's nowhere for it to branch off. And I can call this IL because that's the current that's going through my inductor. Now my next step is to label my node voltages. And I'll start off with my ground node. And if this is ground, I can call this node 100 volts because it's reference to ground. And I can do the same with 275 over here. And VO is reference to ground as well, so I can call this node VO. So the next step is to write KCL. We only have to write one KCL equation, and I'm going to write that for my node VO right here. And for this KCL, we can see that I1 and IL are both pointing towards that node. So I can write I1 plus IL is equal to the current that's pointing away from my node, and that's going to be equal to I2. With that taken care of, I have three resistors that I need to write Ohm's law for. So for the equations for my components, I have that I1 is equal to 100 minus VO divided by 80. For I2, I have VO minus zero divided by 240. And I can say that IL is going to be equal to 275 minus VO divided by 100. And at this point, I have four variables and four equations. So this is a solvable system. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip solving this by hand and put this into a system of equations calculator. And the result of that is that IL is equal to five divided by four, and this is the initial condition of my inductor. And for my capacitor, the initial condition is going to be the node voltage across it. And that happens to be equal to VO because VO is referenced across my capacitor. And in this case, we get that VO is equal to 150 volts. And these are the only two pieces of information that we need to get out of the DC analysis. So now I'll save these values and make some room on the screen. And now I can begin analyzing my main circuit. And we're going to be doing this in Laplace domain. So this is going to be for after that switch moves. So we can clear out this line because now the switch has gone to the second position and we're ready to begin analyzing the circuit. So since we're interested in finding VO, I don't really have to worry about this side of my circuit because that's not going to have any impact on my VO. We only have to analyze this part of our circuit. Beginning the same way as before, let's start off with labeling our component currents and I can call this current IL. And it's important to make sure that this IL current is going in the same direction as the previous IL current that we defined. And I can label a current over here, call this I1, call this I2, and we can call this current over here IC. Now with our component currents labeled, we can move on to our node voltages. And I'll call this my ground. I can call this V1, this V2. And again, because I labeled this ground over here, VO is referenced to ground, and I can call this node VO. So now let's write KCL, and we'll do our first KCL at V2, and at V2 we see that IL is entering the node, and I1 and I2 are leaving the node. So we can say that IL is going to be equal to I1 plus I2, and we can do another KCL over here at VO, and at VO we have I1 plus I2 entering the node, and IC leaving the node. 
And from this, we see that IL is actually going to be equal to IC in this case. Now for the next step, I have to write the equations for my components. Everything I'm about to write is going to be in the S domain, but I'm not going to write as a function of S every single time, because it would start to fill up a lot of space if I did. But keep in mind all the voltage and current values that I write are all going to be a function of S. So let's start with the easy ones, and I can begin with my two resistors. And in this case, we have that I1 is going to be equal to V2 minus VO divided by 25. And I have that I2 is going to be equal to V2 minus VO divided by 100. So now I can write the equation for my 275 volt source. And the equation for that is going to be the potential difference across it. V2 minus V1 is equal to 275 divided by S because we're using the S domain equation for this component after we've taken the Laplace transform of it. Now we can write the equation for our inductor and that's going to be this equation right here. Because the current is flowing in this direction, my V plus is going to be this node right here. So I'll write zero minus. Now on the negative side, we have V1. So we'll say V1 and that's going to be equal to my inductance value L so we'll say 0 0.016 multiplied by S times IL, so S times IL, minus my initial condition. So that's where we bring this back. And we're going to say minus 5 divided by 4. And that takes care of the equation for my inductor. Now lastly, we have our capacitor. And I can say that IC is going to be equal to the capacitance value, which is going to be 80 times 10 to the negative 6 multiplied by S times the potential difference, which is going to be my VO node minus my ground node. So I can write VO minus zero. And now we have to subtract our initial conditions over here. So V plus of zero, we found to be equal to VO, and that was 150. So we'll say minus 150. And V minus of zero was our ground node, and that was equal to zero. So we can say minus zero here. And that's going to be the equation for my capacitor. And at this point, we can solve for all of our voltage and current values as a function of S. So entering these equations into a system of equation solver, I find that VO of S is equal to 150S squared plus 203125 multiplied by S plus this big number. And all this is going to be divided by S cubed plus 1250S squared plus 7, 8, one, two, five, zero, S. So this is our value for VO in terms of S, but now we want to get back to the time domain. So to do that, we have to do an inverse Laplace transform. And at this point, you could enter this into an inverse Laplace transform calculator and you'd have your answer. However, if you don't, you can still do this by hand. Generally, how this is done is you break this into partial fractions and then you use an inverse Laplace transform table to take those individual components of your partial fractions to go back to time domain. In a separate video, I'll be going over how to do partial fractions. But in this video on Laplace, I'm going to directly write the partial fraction expansion of VO of S. So this is going to be 275 divided by S plus negative 62.5 plus 50J. And in this case, j is equal to the square root of negative 1. Typically in mathematics, we say i is equal to the square root of negative 1, but i was already taken for current. So in electrical engineering, we go with j. And this is going to be divided by s plus 625 minus 625j and plus minus 62.5 minus 50j divided by S plus 625 plus 625J. So now using our table, we can find the inverse Laplace transform of our function based on this term and this term right here. This first term is the same as this term over here. And these two terms fit this form down here. So now we can begin writing VO of T. Now this is going to be equal to our first term. After the inverse Laplace, we're going to get k times u of t, where k is our constant, in this case, 275. And this is going to be multiplied by u of t. And what the u of t is doing here is u of t goes from 0 to 1 at 0 and stays 1 for all values. So this is used to keep our function only defined for values greater than 0, because before 0, we had a different circuit when the switch was in a different position. So now we can move on to our second term here. 
And again, this is this one down here. Now, something I want to point out about this is the numerator here is a complex number. So we have k and conjugate k. And what that means is that we have our real number plus our imaginary number in one term. And in the other term, we have our real number minus that same imaginary term. So what this equation is asking us to do is, is to find the magnitude of our numerator and also the angle of that imaginary number as well. And that's going to be our theta term. The alpha and beta term that we have are going to be pulled directly from our denominator and there's no extra work to do there. But we do have to find the magnitude and angle of our numerator. So to do that, we have to do some trigonometry. So if I have these two axes and in this one, I have my real numbers. And in this one, I have my imaginary numbers. I can plot my complex numbers as vectors on my graph. For instance, at this point, negative 62.5, that's one point we have right here. And then we have our imaginary term, which is going to be 50 and negative 50 on the j-axis. So that's going to be right here. We'll say negative 50 on the j-axis and 50 on the j-axis. And that'll give us a point right here. And I can connect that back. And we also have a point here and I can connect that back. But really, we only have to find the magnitude and angle of one of these two. But I'm going to focus on finding this top angle. Starting off, I'm going to find the magnitude of k, and this is going to be the magnitude of k. And to do that, I can use the Pythagorean theorem and to say that the magnitude of k is going to be equal to the square root of my real number squared, 62.5 squared, plus my imaginary number squared, 50 squared, and this is going to give me a value of 80.04. Now, the next thing I need to do is find my angle theta. And to do that, I'm going to find the angle inside my triangle and subtract it from 180. So the angle inside my triangle is going to be the inverse tangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part. So that's going to be 50 on the j-axis divided by 62.5. And this is going to give me an angle of 38 Point six six degrees. And this is just the angle inside my triangle. So to find theta, I have to subtract it from 180. So we can say that theta is equal to 180 degrees minus 38.66. And this gives us a value of 141.34. So now we know the magnitude of K. We know alpha, we know beta, and we know theta. And all we have to do is plug it in. So now to complete our VO of T equation, we have 275 u of t, we're going to write plus 2 multiplied by 80.04, the magnitude of our k, multiplied by e raised to the negative alpha t, and alpha in this case is going to be the real number in our denominator, so that's going to be 625, so minus 625t, and now we have the cosine of beta t, and beta is going to be the imaginary term in my denominator, so we'll write 625 t, and now we have plus theta, and this is our theta term down here, so we can say plus 141.34 degrees, and this is multiplied by u of t as well. And this is the final answer to the problem for v of t for time greater than zero. And that will be it for this video. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, please like and subscribe. I'll see you next time.